19 and in verse 1 through 9. Right, Luke chapter 13 and from verse 1 through 9. It says, Now there were some present at that time who told Jesus about the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mixed with their sacrifices. Jesus answered, Do you think that these Galileans were worse sinners than all the other Galileans because they suffered this way? I tell you, no. But unless you repent, you, will, you too will all perish. Or those 18 who died when the Tower of Siloam fell on them, do you think that they were more guilty than all the others living in Jerusalem? I tell you, no. But unless you repent, you too will all perish. Then he told them this parable. A man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard, and he went to look for fruit on it, but did not find any. So he said to the man who took care of the vineyard, for three years now I have been coming to look for the fruit on this fig tree and haven't found any. Cut it down. Why should it use up the soil? Sir, the man replied, leave it alone for one more year. I'll dig around it and fertilize it. If it bears fruit next year, fine. If not, then cut it down. And the title of today's message is, I will, I'll dig around it and fertilize it. That's in verse 8. It says, I'll dig around it and fertilize it. So, today, uh, this is the first service of the last month of 2022, right? So we're nearing the end of this year. Uh, we are running towards Christmas. And so, um, you know, when it comes to the times and when it comes to running towards Christmas and the advent of our Lord Jesus Christ, uh, we must consider our hearts well, right? Because the advent uh, is that celebration of the coming of the Lord. And so, um, you know, in preparation for that, when we look at our hearts, we should think, and we should reflect, you know, are we a fruit of love and faith prepared to receive him in our hearts, right? And so we should think about that, right? Our hearts. Is it, does it have, you know, the love and faith to really receive the Lord? And in that way, you know, has our heart and has our life of faith um, really matured in that way as a fruit in order to receive him with that? And so how have we run this year? Did we really receive God's love? Did we really receive God's will in our life? Are we walking with Him? Did we walk with Him this year? Are we walking with Jesus Christ um, with us in our life? And so these are things that we should think about as we welcome our Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, and so uh, in today's passage, um, as we do reflect on those things, as we look at today's passage, um, some people here to Jesus are mentioning some very recent events that are happening. They're talking about uh, the slaughter of some Galileans uh, by Pilate, uh, probably what had happened. Uh, we don't know. There's not, you know, the, you know, here only in this passage is it really recorded. So we don't have, it's not like we had newspapers back then and, and we kept them so that we know of everything that happened long ago. Uh, but what we can guess that probably happened where there were some there was some type of disturbance, some type of protest among the Galileans um, there. And so Pilate he he slaughtered many of them. That's what we can guess, right? And because they were probably causing some type of disturbance. And so these people that are coming up to Jesus, it's like kind of it's basically kind of like a political event, right? And what they're saying to Jesus is you know, take a side, right? You know, whose side of this particular news item, this recent event that happened with Pilate, you know, take a side. Are you for Pilate or are you against Pilate, right? That's essentially, you know, if we contextualize it, that's essentially what's happening. It's like, you know, if we look in modern day, um, you know, we have our rulers or politicians and so on and so forth, and then people come up to you and say, hey, um, take a stand, right? Take a political stand, uh, either this way or that way. And so um, the Lord, interestingly, he responds with another event. And this is also another event that we don't know much about. It's only really recorded here, but he is talking about 18 people who died on the Tower of Siloam. And so probably this was, you know, we can guess, some type of construction accident is what we think it is. It was 
was some type of construction accident. It was possibly an aqueduct. You know, they were building a lot of those in Rome. That's what a lot of biblical scholars um, think. And so it was some other type of event. Anyways, they were building this tower that was to be used for some aqueduct in Siloam. And then there was a construction accident. And then 18 people died. 18 people died because of this construction accident from the Roman ruler um, of that colony at that time, that governor of Pilate, right? And so it was another type of thing. I mean, that kind of thing happens too, right? When you look at you know, news, there are events that are just like out of control, and then, you know, how are, how do people react, right, according to those type of things? And so, you know, these two events come, you know, I mean, one is coming to the Lord, the Lord is responding with another recent event that he knows about at the time. And, you know, you look at these two uh, events and what the Lord is trying to say, we have to think about what the Lord's point is. Right? Why is he saying this? And what, it is, what is his point in terms of responding to this question, basically, like, which side are you going to take? What is the Lord's point? And so what he's saying here, basically, is that you look at these two events. One of the events is a man a man-caused event, right? I mean, Pilate, he killed a bunch of Galileans. The other was an accident. But if you do look at both events, they have the same lesson, right? And so what the Lord, in both cases, is warning the listeners, because in both cases, they, they think the same thing, it's that the victims of the tragedy are being judged because of some great evil, right? That is the Lord's point. He's talking about the Galilean suffering in this way. This was the common mentality of the Jews at the time, that the victims of this tragedy, that something bad happened to them, whether it be man-made or whether it be an accident, they're being judged because of some great evil that, that they did, right? And so the Jews always assumed somehow that, you know, if, if, if there was some kind of punishment, if there was, you know, the, that they were sinners, right? That they were sinners. And so what is happening to them right now, right? The events that are happening to them right now, this is punishment directly one-to-one -one equal to this type of sinful, some type of sinful thing that we may not know about, only they know about, really, but it is some type of sin, and all we can see is the conclusion, and so they are being punished one-to-one -one based on some type of sin that they committed, right? And so this is really how the Jews viewed things. And so, you know, let's think about this, you know, really, as humans, you know, as humans, do we really have a right to make that kind of judgment, right? We're just other humans. You know, we can't know what is going on in the life of this other person. Do we uh, really, can we make this judgment about another person that, you know, this particular thing is, is because you committed sin in this other way. And, you know, we're just humans and we can't really know the truth, right? So, you know, events happen, you know, whether they are God's judgment or whether they're for some other type of reason, you know, we don't, we don't know. Like, we can't make judgments like that. We don't know the reason, necessarily, why things happen. God, God knows. God has a reason for everything that happens. It could be judgment. It could be something else. There could be many factors involved that you know, we don't really know. But, you know, we, you know, in our minds, we tend to, you know, equate. You know, we, we want to make some type of simple explanation for, for something. And so, you know, when you look at the Jews, they had that kind of mentality, but this isn't just a story of long ago. This is like definitely, definitely, when you think about it, a story that, that we have as well in our lives. And so, as we look at our own individual lives, we do a lot of the same things, right? And so, for example, we, we are suffering on something, right? There's something bad that happened in our life, there's something I'm suffering in, and what we feel like is that the suffering I am receiving right now, this, this bad suffering and, and what's going on with me, that is a proportional result to my sin, right? That's what we think, right? It's because I sinned sometime in the past, right? I did something, and so, you know, what I'm receiving now is exactly proportional to some type of sin that I committed. And so that's what we think. We make this one-to-one -one proportional equation 
thinking I'm being punished proportionally to how bad I am, right? Because I'm a bad sinner, so I receive a punishment so bad according to the, you know, the, the sin I just committed. So, you know, let's say I'm suffering on something. It means I did, I did something bad. Right? And, and then let's take the opposite way, right? And so let's say that I'm not suffering, like I'm in joy. Then we probably also think the opposite. We think that, okay, it's because I did something good. And we look at God like, I did really good before you, God. And then so, hey God, that's why you know, we, we think so highly of ourselves in that way. Right? We think, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm happy, I'm joyful right now, and it's because I did something. But, you know, we know when it comes to blessings and grace of, the grace of God that we are in joy, you know, what is that by? That is by the grace of God. That is just simply His unconditional love and His blessing and His grace upon us. That's why we are in joy. It's not, you know, necessarily because, you know, you know I, I am so great or we, we have, we're looking at the, the grace of God, right? We, will, with the, we look at the life of faith, we look at the grace of God. And so, you know, conversely, when we look at sin, we cannot look at it the same way either. It's not that we can just say, hey, I did something bad, and so the suffering I'm facing right now is simply because of the suffering that, that you know, because of the sinful thing I just did. And so, you know, when we look at our mindset, it's the exact same. And it's the exact same as the Jews of long ago. Of course, they're using this in some type of you know, political event with other people, saying, hey, those other people are victims because of their sin, right? That they don't even know about, but they're making those kind of judgments. But when you look at it, we have, even towards ourselves, that very, very exact same legalistic mindset, right? And so, you know, uh, this legalistic mindset is the reason why, you know, we see the atmosphere of the Jewish leaders, the Pharisees of long ago. They sit, you know, in the seat of, of judgment, right? Um, thinking that they understand all of the reason why God's judgment is, is because these people are sinners, right? And so we think in that way. And so um, it's, you know, you know, it's the reason really when you look at that atmosphere of long ago, uh, between the ones sitting in the seat of judgment, you know, the Pharisees and the Jewish leaders, and then there were, um, you know, the ones who, you know, were sinners, like the tax collectors and the prostitutes and so on and so forth. Um, and they felt, you know, there was this atmosphere of being, you know, so oppressed and, and burdened in their faith. In fact, you know, so much so, you know, this oppression of, like, the reason for my sin, right, is because, you know, the reason for my punishment is for my sin, you see that, you know, these, these quote-unquote sinners, you know, you, you see people that, that, that the Lord is, is, is bringing in, they're, they're, there's this, this, like this, these rocks in the heart, you know, they self-torture because of their sin, right, that, that's what happens, when you really think that, oh, okay, the reason why I'm suffering now is because of my sin like that way, then you just self-torture, right? You self-torture because of your sin. So, you know, talking about this, I want to make it very clear that, you know, we, we can't know. We can't know anything, really. You know, we're so limited, we're so weak as humans. You know, we, you know how, how are we supposed to know the reason why we are suffering and why things happen, bad things happen in our lives, and you know, accidents happen, or someone did something, or maybe it was intentional because someone else did something against us, like Pilate did to the Galileans, or some act, some construction accident happens. We, we don't know why things happen. Whether it's other people do it to us intentionally, or whether it's in some kind of just you know coincidence of events and something like that happens. You know, we we cannot know. You know, always the reason for suffering, and also the Lord is making it clear here that it's not proportional to how much I sinned, right? It, it, it's, it's not like that, right? It's not as if I did something bad, so this is why I can't enjoy God's joy in my life. This is a very, very, when you really, really examine it, it's the Jewish legalistic mindset here, right? And so, you know, what then is the true problem of the Jews here, the Jewish leaders, and what is the problem of us as well too? Well, we come to find that the true problem really 
for this legalistic mentality that we have is, is we lack the fundamentals of faith, right? We are immature and we lack really the fundamentals of faith. And so, you know, when it comes to the fundamentals of faith, you know, Jesus, he exhorts that here, right? And so that's why he says um, the core thing he's trying to tell us, the core thing behind this whole message is repent or you too will perish, right? That's in verse 5. I tell you no, but unless you repent, you too will perish. So he's talking about repentance, right? And so that's what the Lord is exhorting here instead. Rather than, you know, thinking about this and that, oh, what's the reason for this and that, and then we, we, we get stuck and we just self-torture, and then we have all these things like going on, and then it's just like, you know, we, we, we all get into these kinds of states a lot. You know, I can tell you how many times it's happened to me. You can ask my wife, you know, sometimes it's just like crazy, like, like crazy in my life, right? And so, you know, we can all feel like that, I think, you know, throughout the year, you know, we could have felt like that many times in the year, and then, you know, as we walk in the year, it like builds up, it builds up, it builds up, and then we're, we're here in December, and it's towards the end of the year, we're getting to the end of the year like that, and, you know, we, we can feel like that, like, oh, you know, you know, what are we supposed to do? But, you know, Jesus, he just gets back, really, just to the fundamentals, like, don't get stuck in, in all of those things, but just, just repent, right, just repent. You know, really, it's very simple. Like, you know, we, you know, we, 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 we're thinking about too many things, but, you know, they're thinking about too many things. Jews are thinking about too many things. Pilate, or this position, or that position related to the Galileans, or this Tower of Siloam, and the 18 who died, and this factor, and that factor, and this factor. But, you know, we cannot, you know, we cannot uh, know the whole reason, but, you know, we can repent. Right? We can repent. And if we do not repent, then yes, we will face judgment. You know, this is what the Bible teaches us. If we do not repent, right, there is judgment for sins that we cannot avoid. All sins, you know, there is judgment behind that. There is judgment um, towards that sin. So repent, right? Repent first. Repent, repent, and receive the grace and the forgiveness of God. And so, you know, it's really true when you look at it, maybe we're sinning this much or that much, or we're sitting like in this part, or there are different points, and, and compared to other people, it can be like this and like that, but, you know, really, when you look at it, it's like way up here, right? And then we're down here, and we're sitting like this way or that way or this way or that way, but for God, that's like way up here, he looks at us and we're just playing around, you know, down here, and that's really what it is, you know, for us. You know, or connection point between God is not accordingly to how much I'm sinning or whatever, I'm, you know, all these things in my life, but our connection point with God is our hearts, right? It's our hearts of faith. And so, you know, that heart of faith to be before God, that is repentance. It's opening up before God when it comes to all of our sin and all of our situation and everything that we are doing, you know, the very, very simple situation is, the very simple solution to all of this is repent and have faith and receive Jesus Christ and the forgiveness of our sins. Right? He is the one who took the punishment for us instead of us. Right? And so we have sin and it should be punished. Right? It should be punished. But the Lord is the one who took up that punishment instead of us. So repent and receive Jesus Christ and eternal life with faith. And really, you, you come to find that, you know, really the solution is Jesus Christ. Right? And that's what Christmas is, right? The whole solution to all of the problems of this entire world in all of history, there's so many problems, right? There's so many, so many. You look at the Bible in the Old Testament and, and all the prophets and the people of faith, and there's so many problems. Like this problem and that problem and this problem and that problem and too many things and too many mistakes and all these kinds of things happen. But, you know, the solution to all of that, right, the resolution to all of that was Jesus Christ and his cross and the resurrection. So whether it's before Jesus or after Jesus, it's all the same, right? So before Jesus, the whole solution, everything was resolved or, uh, on the person of Jesus Christ. Do you think that changes afterwards? No. It's the same, right? Every single thing from Jesus until now, right? All of it is resolved, right? The solution, the only answer 
is the coming of Jesus Christ on Christmas. That is, that is, you know, he is, he is the way, the truth, and the life. And so, you know, really, when you look at our lives of faith, then all it is really is repentance and faith. You know, the problem really isn't what sin I committed or what the proportionality of the punishment is according to whatever sin I committed. More, you know, than like thinking about all these little, repenting of like every single little individual sin, actually, it's just repenting that I'm a sinner and I need God, I need Him, and I need Jesus Christ. I need the salvation of Jesus Christ. And so, um, that's what, you know, this is the basic point of the Lord as He goes into this parable. So let's look at the parable. The parable's fun. So let's look at the, this fun little parable that he gives. So um, uh, Luke chapter 13 and verse 6 and 7. He says, Then he told this parable. A man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard, and he went out to look for fruit on it. But he did not find any. And so he said to the man who took care of the vineyard, For three years now I've been coming to look for fruit on this fig tree, and haven't found any. Cut it down. Why should it use up the soil? So, um, like many conversations, like many parables that the Lord gives, there's a context to this parable. So we just read that context, right? So there's this conversation Jesus is having. He refers to these two events. And that topic, what it's doing is it's leading, leading to something even deeper. Right? He, he wants to explain heavenly things even deeper. And so that's why he uses a parable of fig tree, right? The parable of the fig tree. Because, you know, what are parables, um, you know, like poetry, you know, when someone, when we write poetry, what happens? We write poetry, and it's only really like a handful of words, but that handful of words has much, much more deep meaning beyond just, you know, the technicalities of the words itself. It's a metaphor that tries to, that, that speaks to us on many different and that's exactly what a parable is. A parable, even though he's just giving this illustration, this example, it applies to us on many, many different levels. And so, inside of this parable, there was an owner. Right? There's this owner of this vineyard, and inside of this vineyard that this owner has, there's a, a fig tree growing in it. Right? And so, um, for this vineyard, there is another man that is taking care of this vineyard for him, including um, this fig tree. Right? And so the problem is, is that this fig tree inside of this vineyard, it's been three years already, but it has not borne fruit. Right? And so it's been three years, but has not borne fruit. And so, um, you know, that what does this mean? You know, what are the different levels, and how can we meditate on this? So the first level that we should really, really look at is about, of course, the context of the people around Jesus at the time. So once again, the Jewish leaders, right? The Jewish people, the Israelites. And so when it comes to uh, the Israelites, um, it is where, when you look at the history of the Israelites inside of the Old Testament and so on and so forth, God gave them time, right? God gave them time. You know, in the case of the parable, there are three years, but you know, if, you look at the Is if you look at the Israelites, God gave them, you know, centuries and centuries of time to really prepare their hearts and be a fruit before God. And then, you know, even if you want to look at, like, the technicalities of even the three years, you could even argue that, hey, Jesus was basically on this earth in minis public ministry for three years, right? He lived 30 years of private life and then three years of public ministry time of John's baptism uh, towards his cross and his resurrection. That was approximately three years, right? And so you could look at it that way as well, too. And so anyways, they had time, right? There was time for them to, who, you know, God, the owner of the vineyard, gave time for uh, this fig tree, the Israelites, to bear fruit. Right? And so, um, you know, how is the situation? So, you know, God... You know, God's people, right? God's people, it's like that. We are God's people, and we are in his garden, right? His vineyard, his garden. We're in his garden. We're in his kingdom, right? But what is the problem is, is that we don't bear fruit. Right? We don't bear fruit. 
So we are not a fruit of love and faith. We have not matured, right? And so you have the seed, the seed is planted, and it should grow, grow, grow from the bottom to the stalk and then the head, and then it should grow like a fruit, right? And so you should, it should grow fruit, but it doesn't mature to that level, right? It doesn't mature to the level of a fruit of love before Jesus. And so it doesn't mature to that level, so when the time of judgment comes, right, and so it's been three years here, and the time of judgment comes, right, and so the Lord came, and the prepared ones didn't receive him, right? Did they really earnestly, with heart of love, if they loved God, right, even if they, they, they really didn't, couldn't understand everything, but if you think about it, if they really, really loved God, and so, you know, people look at the Israelites and they think, well, they were just thinking this way and that way about the Lord, and it just wasn't according to their expectations. And so, yeah, you could argue like that, but I think it's definitely way more than that. It's that, you know, inside of them, inside of their hearts, you know, were they really, did they really love God, right? You know, as we praise and we give worship to God, it is about our love, you know, what is really inside of our heart and this authentic love that we have? And so it's really they didn't have because if they had, if they really had the love of God earnestly inside of their heart, then you know no matter what, like this way or that way, whether they saw Jesus this way or that way, eventually, at some point in time, God gave them time, right? God gave them time. Eventually, at some point in time, they would accept God's Son, Jesus Christ, right? Even if they didn't see it at first, right? Even Nicodemus, he took some time. Like, he didn't, really didn't understand, like, what was going on with the Lord, like, even coming to him at night, right? And, you know, even many of the disciples were, were this way, too. They, they couldn't really fully see at first. It's not like, it's like, aha, you know? You know? I mean, it was like that for, for some at some points. It can be like that for some at some points, but others it wasn't. But no matter what, what we can say that, if a person really is a fruit of love, right, then Jesus Christ, who is the full revelation of God's love, right? Isn't that who the Son is? So the Son came to this earth, the Word became flesh. It means that He is the full revelation of God who is love, right? So He is God's love fully revealed. God's love, God's Word to the people fully revealed. If, you know, they really much had the heart of love inside of them, that they would accept, right? they would have accepted God's Son. But instead, they're not doing that. They're putting burdens on people uh, with the law, judging them, blaming them, oh, you're a sinner, this is why the bad thing happened to you in life, and all of that in order to keep their position, their power, their politics, all of those things, right? That's what's going on. And so, you know, how would the owner God, right? He's the owner in this parable. That's who this parable is, right? So how is the owner of the vineyard, God in, in his kingdom, you know, what would he do? Well, there is a time of judgment, right? If there is sin, if there is unfruitfulness, this is going to be judged, right? If there is sin and unfruitfulness, there must be a punishment carried for that, that sin, right? And so there is a time of judgment, there is a time to check on the fruit, right? And so, you know, of course, when you look at it in our lives, we all will face time of judgment. We looked at this last week, right? You know, we all die and we face judgment before God. So you can look at that point of judgment, right? So there is, of course, more life judgment that we have in our life, right? But, you know, even as we go in life, we also face times of judgment in our life. And I think really the end of the year is really time to check as well too, right? And so we go towards the end of the year, and then we should look back and we should think, you know, we should judge, right? We should really self-examine, you know, what have we done? Was it meaningfully a fruit of love before God, right? And so that's why, you know, really when we look, last week I spoke about time. I spoke about time, right? God is in heaven and we are on earth. And so, you know, we are planted like that. We're, we're, we're kind of like that, you know, this is... The, the garden, this earth, right? And so we are planted like a seed on this earth. And the Word, the Word of God, it teaches us how to bear fruit. God is the one who makes it grow. And so we don't grow on our own. We have faith. We open up our heart. God pours love into us, and, you know, we grow, right? We grow. And so, 
Um, you know, like, let's think about it. I mean, there's a lot of parables like this in, inside of the Bible, like, to grow, right? So, you know, another way we can think about this is, you know, the Bible says, the Lord is the shepherd, and so we're like sheep, right? And so how are we? We're like sheep, and so sheep, what do sheep do? Sheep just, like, wander and wander around and do this way and that way, and if they did that, if they just wandered by themselves, going this way and that way, then probably they would go hungry, because they wouldn't know where to get the food, right? And so the sheep have to follow the shepherd, right? And so the sheep, they follow the shepherd, and so that, you know, the shepherd feeds them to the food, and then they can, you know, eat the food, and then they can grow. And it's the same for us, right? We are so disobedient, we follow this way and that way inside of the world according to our sins, and, you know, that's why we, or spirits, just go hungry, you know, like that. But instead, we should follow God, right? We shouldn't, we, we don't grow. Like, what is the reason why we don't mature and grow? And the reason why is because we're disobedient and we don't listen to God. And so we don't have faith and we don't follow the truth, His Word, that guides us, right? Jesus Christ who guides us. And so, you know, what we have to know is that there is a limit to time. Right? The wise teacher, last week we saw that, teaches us that, right? The Bible says, you know, we're going to live and then we'll die. And so if we know all the things of this earth, there's a judgment point in time for all the things of this earth. It is, it's, it's all meaningless, right? In Ecclesiastes, it says, meaningless, meaningless, says the teacher, everything is meaningless. And so we are born into this world living, but then we will die. And so all of the things are that we have on this earth, that we collect and we do on this earth, of this earth, are meaningless. And so really, when you think about this past year, and what we've been doing in our life, all the sinful things, all the stuff of this earth, you know, the wise teacher teaches us, the Bible teaches us, you know, a lot of these things that we do are just useless. Right? It's just useless and will eventually fade away. And the Bible teaches us that instead, instead of living for the treasures of this earth that are just going to rust and be destroyed and fade away, you know, we must prepare for heaven. You know, we've got to prepare for heaven. And so we've got to prepare for heaven and eternal life. And so that is actually meaningful. And so, you know, it does say that God set eternity in our hearts, right? And we can store up. There are such things as storing up treasures in heaven. It's not the same as storing up treasures on earth. And you, you can't just store it there. But where you can store up that treasure in heaven is, you know, God who set eternity in our hearts, right? Loving God, you know, praising Him, and even loving others, right? As we love others, we are loving God. And all of those things, as we save souls too, loving others or brothers and sisters in church, loving the many, many lost souls out there inside of this world, well, that's like a treasure. When I have love like that, that's like a treasure. It gets stored up in my heart, and this is taken, this treasure is taken with me to eternity. And so that's like, that's like preparation, right? So we need to prepare for eternal life. And so when we know that, then, you know, that, that's when our, we, we, we mature, right? That's when our heart matures. That's what being a fruit of love is, is, you know, really, you know, really receiving with faith God's love and building that and building that, building up and maturing, and then we become a fruit before God. And so the wisdom is, is knowing that there's a time, right? Our life is time. And so we all know that there's going to be an end to our life here, and then we go to eternal life, you know, storing up those treasures and growing as a fruit of love. But, you know, even, you know, our time, right? We have, like, a certain amount of time. You know, we have time when it comes to this year. Um, we have time in the time that I'm going to be here in, um, you know, um, you know, some of you are students, and so, like, you know, you're going to be, you know, studying for this certain amount of time. It's knowing the time and growing as a fruit of love. So we come to see that knowing the time is very important, right? And so that's what it's talking about here. So this beginning of this parable emphasizes that judgment and that time and really being a fruit and how God checks, right? So that's the emphasis of the first part of the parable. And now let's look to the very last part. So let's look at Luke chapter 13 and in verse 8 and 9. So Luke chapter 13, verse 8 and 9. 
Sir, the man replied, leave it alone for one more year, and I'll dig around it and fertilize it. If it bears fruit next year, fine. If not, then cut it down. So, um, you know, about what we just talked about, right? So the first part of the parable, we emphasize God's judgment, time, and being a fruit before God, right? That kind of thing, right? But uh, there's another misunderstanding we have, and it's going to relate back to the first part of this message. There's another misunderstanding. The other misunderstanding we have is that we forget, or we don't know, or we misunderstand, and we think that God has no mercy. Right? That's what we think. That God has no mercy, and the judgment is set. Right? And so, you know, three years, right? Three years, the time has passed, the time is spent. So, you know, it's, it's like already over. Like, how is there mercy? The time is already gone. How is there mercy? Right? And so, you know, when you really, when you look at at Previously, when we were looking at the events, you know, we see it in that way too. People look at things that they do, like the sin that they committed, as some kind of fate towards this punishment that they're experiencing, the suffering that they're experiencing now. Like I said, it's a one-to-one -one sort of proportionality that people put inside of their mentality. In other words, this legalistic mindset is also a fatalistic one that the fate is set. And so we think that God has no mercy, the judgment is set, three years, the time has passed, how is there mercy? But, you know, what we come to find here in this parable as the Lord is explaining, what is he explaining here? The Lord is explaining that the Lord, who is the Lord? Who is Jesus Christ? He is the Lord of life. Right? He is the Lord of life that came to this earth, right? And he saved us. And so when it comes to the mercy and the salvation of God, it's explained, it's all explained here, really, when you look at this parable. He says, leave it, right? He says, leave it one more year, I will dig around and fertilize it. I will dig around and fertilize it. So, you know, that's the title of today's message, I'll dig around and fertilize it. You know, what is this speaking about? It's saying, you know, wait for judgment and, you know, let's go at it again. You know, let's go at it again. You know, that's what fertilizer does, right? And so you have a plant here and it's growing, but it doesn't bear fruit. But you want to get more nutrients in, right? So you got to dig around it a little bit more. Farmers do this. you got to dig around it a little bit more. Stick in that, that nice, you know, nutrient-rich, you know, fertilizer. And then hopefully that nutrient-rich fertilizer is going to seep into this plant and then eventually bear fruit, right? And so do that, put in that extra nutrient-rich fertilizer, you know, and wait, wait for it before judging. Wait one more year and wait for judgment. So, um, you know, when it comes to, you know, fate, right? So for us, that's how we kind of think about things. We think like, like death, right? There is death, right? And so that death is set. We all know that, the Bible talks about that. That death, no one avoids that fate. But what we misunderstand is that, okay, so no one avoids the fate, so that means that even in life, there is no mercy, right? There is no mercy, and everything is just fate like that. That's a misunderstanding. Jewish law, the world, it teaches us this fate, fatalistic mentality of life. But, you know, how should we be? You know, we shouldn't be like that, right? We shouldn't really be like that. We shouldn't be legalistic. We shouldn't have this worldly, fatalistic mentality. And you just whatever whatever happens happens and, and that's your life and that's it. I mean that's how the world looks at often looks at people, right? You're just so on and so forth and that's it. And then we look at our life and my life is set and that's it. I'm just gonna like die like you know the way I am right now. And, and a lot of people really look at life you know in this fatalistic mindset. But how should we be? We shouldn't give up. Right? We shouldn't give up. You know, yes, you know, we have to bear fruit. No one's saying that there's not a judgment and we should be a, a, a fruit. We should bear fruit. We should have that faith and love before God, right? And so that has to happen, right? But, you know, we shouldn't give up because we need to know. You know, God is a way maker, right? He finds a way, right? He finds a way and he provides a different way for us. And what is that way? Well, actually, it's really simple. It's really, really simple, actually. Jesus Christ already gave us the answer, and he said it very simply. He said, repent. Right? I mean, that's all, really, when you look at it. He gave us the way. It's a very fast way. It's a very simple way, and it's a very clear way. Repent. Right? Repent. 
actually, you know, look at it, look at it this way, the fact that I am still alive, I'm living and breathing right now, at this very moment, by definition, means that I have time to repent. Right? The very fact that I can listen to the words of Jesus coming out of his mouth in red letters right here to the people there long ago and coming to us here today, the very fact that I can listen to his words means that I'm alive and I'm breathing and that fate of death still hasn't hit me yet. And so, by definition, I have time to repent. Right? And so this ridiculous notion that we have that, oh, you know, my life is set, and I'm just like the way I am, and that nothing's going to change, and that, that, you know, from now until the end of that death, when I do die in that faith, it's all going to be the same. You know, we really come to find how foolish we are. Right? We're really, really foolish you know, like this. And so, you know, really, the Jewish leaders, the Pharisees, think about it, even for them at that time. So there's people listening to this parable. At that time, you know, Jesus is still there. You know, couldn't they repent? Of course they can. <laughs> at that very moment, they can repent and accept the Lord Jesus, right? They could do it at that time. And then, let's say, well, hey, you know, there's those evil ones that put Jesus on the cross, right? And, you know, they're, they're you know, like... They, they, they put Jesus on the cross, and, you, and then so like the fate is set, right? The fate is set for them. No, it's not like that either. After Jesus died on the cross, like he resurrected. And so even the people that put him on the cross, you know, can't they like afterwards accept him with faith? You know, of course that can happen. Look at the Apostle Paul, right? What happened to the Apostle Paul? You know, he committed the worst of sins. So, you know, after Jesus died on the cross, there was the first martyr of Christianity, and this was the deacon Stephen, right? Well, who was leading the mob to go kill Stephen, the first martyr of Christianity? Well, this was Paul, right? This was Saul, that wicked, evil Pharisee and Jewish leader. But what did he do? He repented. He met Jesus Christ, received him into his life, and he was forgiven. And he was forgiven. And so, you know, what is, you know, the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ into this world was the complete overturning of all of the problems and the issues of history. It was overturned at the coming of Jesus Christ. And even when Jesus was here, there were all these problems and all these issues surrounding Jesus and all these kinds of times. And, and, and all of that, you know, culminated in, you know, the killing, his murder on the cross, like that he took up the cross willingly for all of us, but, you know, what did God do? He overturned it to the resurrection, right? And so, that's how God is. That's why He is the way maker, right? That's who God is. He, you know, even in the situation of the cross, you know, God brought the resurrection, and so that everybody can just accept Jesus Christ's cross and His resurrection with faith, right? They can, with faith, and repent, repent and have faith. And so Paul, he became a great apostle. It wasn't fatalistic. You know, his life was not set. You know, he's, uh, you know, when it comes to us, I'm like still alive and breathing now. I'm listening to this parable that Jesus gave, and I'm listening to it now 2,000 years later. I'm listening to it right now. I, I'm still breathing with time, and God has grace, and he will allow us to repent and really receive him. And so really, what is Christmas? You know, it's that the whole world should be a fruit before God, but it was depraved and sin, and the truth is, all of the people in this world should have been destroyed. There was no solution, and all of the people in this world and throughout history should have been destroyed completely because of the depraved sin. But what did God do? He provided the way. And let's look at Romans chapter 5, and in verse 6. Romans chapter 5. And in verse 6, you see, at just the right time, when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. So what does Paul say? He says, at just the right time, right? At just the right time, God sent his son that whoever believes in him shall not perish, right? It says in earlier, repent, you, you repent or you too will perish. Well, well, we shall not perish, but if we believe in him, we shall not perish but have eternal life. And so, you know, maybe uh, this year I ignored uh, Jesus Christ. I ignored God's call 
for me. Uh, maybe I was just messing around inside of this world. What did I do in 2022? Maybe I thought fatalistically, like nothing can happen, it's too late. But what we need to know is that God's grace is Jesus Christ, His cross, and His resurrection. It means it's not too late. <laughs> it's not too late. I can still repent, have faith, and the love of God, and God can overturn every single circumstance in my life from before. He can still overturn it, just like He did with the resurrection. Right? And so, even like 2022, you know, I'm giving you this message in the first service of the last month of the year. What I'm trying to say is that it's not too late. It's not too late even for this year. Right? We still have time to repent and have faith in God. There, it means actually there is no situation in life. There's not even the worst of situations in life. The worst of the situations in life was Jesus Christ carrying the cross. But God still takes care of it. God still can overturn it with the resurrection. God can still overturn more problems, right? Uh, like, what are our problems compared to the cross of Jesus, actually, when you think, look at it? You know, for God, God always takes care of us. He provides the way. He is the way maker, right? And he takes care of us with grace. The problem is not that, uh, it is the problem for us, like God is like always like, like there. He's just like with us, always there, providing like the ways, like all the time. The problem is me. The problem is us not opening up our hearts with faith. But, you know, today the Lord is exhorting us. Repent. Repent. Love God. Receive His guidance. It's not too late for God to do amazing things in us. We can still dig around. <laughs> like, 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 look around us. Like, it's December, so that's what we, you know, that's why I said the title of today's message. Like, what can we dig around us? And where can I pour? Like fertilizer. I need, I need that fertilizer. I need the, the nutrients of God's love, His Word, Jesus Christ, His Holy Spirit in my life. Get that into my heart, and really, God will help us bear fruit in our life. And so that's deeply engraved today's message, this great parable inside of our lives of faith. Understand the heart of the Lord towards us, and no matter the worst of situation, God will still take care of us. You will make a way. God will allow us to live. Let's pray. Uh, Father God, we thank you, Lord. Uh, Lord, truly you are the way maker. You provide the way no matter what, Lord. For uh, when we look at our lives, we are so sinful and limited, and we're just running around in this world um, doing whatever, sinning. And Lord, we, we are just like, you know, in that, we're just like stuck in ourselves with this legalistic mindset, thinking, oh, the bad things we do, the mistakes and the accidents that happen in our life, it's all because of this or that, and we, Lord, we, we, we get stuck with this kind of uh, fatalistic mindset in, in faith, Lord. But Lord, uh, you taught us um, through your son, Jesus Christ, who came into this earth on, that, on Christmas and overturned all of history from before until even now, Lord, and, and beyond. You overturn all of history through the coming of your Son, Jesus Christ, on this Christmas. And Lord, you showed us through your life that even in the worst of the situations of the cross, Lord, you overturn with the resurrection. And so, Lord, um, no matter what we are facing now in our life, we know that you are the way maker, Lord. You're the one that provides uh, the way, that you are the way, the truth, and the life. And you will not let us perish, but you are the one that, believing in your Son, Jesus Christ, uh, we can receive eternal life. We thank you. For your love and grace in the life of Jesus.